This conference will now be recorded. All right. Morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us virtually for this meeting of the Air Quality Control Advisory Council. Um, Randy, is there anything you'd like to walk us through logistics wise before uh, our chair, Todd Chasen, and I give some opening remarks? Uh, nothing in particular. This is just a, a reminder today's meeting with the council is just to provide some briefings on upcoming climate actions that the department is uh, considering and working through at the moment. Um, we only have a, the only action item that we will be bringing before you is approval of meeting minutes um, from our previous meeting and then just an update at the end of uh, some potential meetings uh, for the rest of the season. But uh, it's, it's uh, something you can just take on right now. Um, all yours. Thank you though. Thanks Randy. Uh, Todd, I'll defer to you. Would, would you like to kick us off first or would you like me to offer some thoughts? Uh, no, you can go ahead and get started. Good morning. Great. Thanks, Todd. Well, good to see everyone uh, on the screen here. Um, so as Randy mentioned, we uh, have briefings today, no action items. Um, our climate change program is joining us to talk through a couple of the regulations um, that are still, uh, still in the oven over here uh, at MDE. Uh, they are two regulations uh, called for by the governor's executive order on uh, climate change a couple of months ago. Um, they are in a similar uh, uh, policy vein as some of the regulations you've looked at lately. Um, they are dealing uh, mostly with greenhouse gas emissions and other pollutants uh, that come from buildings. Um, so Mark Stewart, our climate change program manager here at MDE will provide that briefing. Uh, two very interesting new regulations uh, that we'll be bringing to the council um, uh, uh, in the first half of next year uh, in the form of regulatory text after we um, do some more policy design, some stakeholdering here um, uh, before we uh, actually fully draft those regulations. So uh, today will be your first preview of those two um, uh, in some detail that we're implementing under the executive order. Um, and also the climate change uh, plan that we issued last December. Um, just some other uh, other news. Uh, we're coming uh, up on the end of the ozone season here. Um, when we have a final count of um, uh, uh, ozone exceedances, we'll bring that to the council uh, with another update, and we'll see you know, sort of where we landed this season exactly, and what our three-year design value means. Uh, as everyone will recall. The, um, uh, the Canadian wildfires last year uh, bumped us out of attainment of the, the latest ozone standard. Um, and so that kicked into uh, you know, all the various policies, uh, procedures under the Clean Air Act where we're not complying with the ozone standard. So we have to do more, uh, more planning, more regs, uh, more requirements incorporated for large projects. Um, where we end up at the end of this ozone season will determine whether uh, we are potentially back in uh, attainment um, uh, 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 depending on how EPA will act or not on our math about how to address the wildfires. So there's a, a, a lot of uncertainty there for the next couple of months, but hopefully by December we'll be able to bring <clears throat> a better picture to the council of um, what we expect the state's sort of formal attainment status with ozone will be uh, in the next couple of years. And then there will be formal processes uh, next year to sort of uh, uh, codify that uh, status, so to speak. Um, another uh, topic for uh, National Ambient Air Quality Standards is that EPA, um, of course, updated the fine particle standard earlier this year. Um, our assessment so far indicates that the state is already attaining that standard. So uh, we will again be following the formal processes whenever uh, a standard is updated and you're already in attainment. There's a process you go through to demonstrate that. Um, uh, and to get that in place with EPA. So we'll be following that process here. Uh, we have until February uh, for that, but everyone uh, should expect that we are already attaining that standard. Um, so that should be uh, relatively smooth sailing in terms of the Clean Air Act processes. Okay, so um, uh, news that there will be news on ozone, uh, we'll see, and uh, news that there's not really much news on fine particles as, part of, as far as the Clean Air Act is concerned. Um, but after we approve the minutes here, uh, we'll hear about um, 
uh, a couple of regulations that are important for both climate change and ozone, because uh, NOx is at play uh, in these rigs, as Mark will explain. Um, so looking forward to the, the council's input on these um, regulations at this phase, where they're sort of uh, policy concepts that are coming together into regulation. Uh, and then we'll be bringing them to you again um, once they're more fully formed uh, for your formal action um, uh, early next year. Okay, Todd, those are my opening remarks. I'll turn to you to take us through the minutes and the briefings when you're ready. Excellent. Um, good morning again, everybody. Thank you, Chris, for the, uh, the summary and the update. Randy, do we need to take attendance or are you good with the electronic um, attendance on the screen? Um, we are we are good with going through that, Todd. If you wish to just do in, introductions for the council, you're more than welcome. Um, this is again a little bit more of an informal meeting, but but your call as, as chair. Uh, if you've got the attendance, and that works for me, with no need for the uh, the formality. Um, as uh, Chris had mentioned, the only action item we have is the approval of the minutes. Uh, they were sent around by email last week, so everybody should have had an opportunity to take a look at it. Does anyone have any questions or comments before we vote to approve? Okay, hearing none, do I give, have a motion to uh, to approve the minutes? I do, Sania um, I do approve the meeting. Thank you. And a second? I'll second. Thank you, Weston. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Any opposition? Okay, the minutes are approved. I think we're ready for our briefing. Thanks, Todd. Okay, Mark Stewart, uh, Climate Change Program Manager here at MDE, will walk us through the briefing. Morning, Mark. Hey, yeah, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, happy to be with you today, especially because I'm fresh off of a uh, primitive camping trip with the kids in Western Maryland, which was fun but it's nice being back to you know flowing water um let me see what happens if i switch to this to present mode can someone confirm that you're able to see that full screen we are we are mark let's get it all righty uh let me just try and hide some controls here Okay. All right. Well, I'm, uh, I have the honor of walking us through this briefing on what we're calling the clean heat rules. These are uh, two new regulations that we're developing called the clean heat standard and the zero emission heating equipment standard. And uh, as a quick background on the, uh, the issue, which, which Chris just laid out at the top here, of course, burning fuel in buildings produces air pollution that's harmful to human health and contributes to climate change. Uh, what we see is that um, the combustion of fossil fuels, primarily for space and water heating in buildings, uh, represents about 70% of the NOx emissions from stationary sources in the state. Of course, the transportation sector is still the leading source of NOx emissions, but within our stationary sources, buildings are the, the primary driver. Uh, and in fact, NOx emissions from buildings is about uh, is more than three times uh, the, the volume of uh, NOx emissions from power plants. So pre pretty significant source that's important to address and important to address for many reasons that this council is well aware of. Uh, NOx and other forms of air pollution from fuel burning equipment harms children and adults in many ways, uh, including uh, asthma and shortness of breath, premature death, heart attack. Um, cognitive functioning, right? And these are among the reasons why Maryland is required to reduce criteria pollutants and meet increasingly stringent air quality standards to protect the public's health. When we look at greenhouse gas emissions, we see that fuel burning equipment is responsible for about 16% of Maryland's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that trend uh, is projected to decrease as the state in, uh, implements a number of new climate policies. Uh, this is a projection that we've shown to you before, it's from our climate plan, most recent climate plan, which shows, among other uh, sectors, fuel use in buildings uh, decreasing over time in order to meet Maryland's requirements to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 60% from 2006 levels by 2031 and achieve net zero emissions by 2045. 
However, and unfortunately, current, uh, current policies have not so far reduced total fuel use in Maryland's building sector. Uh, this remains a, a fairly stubborn um, sector of, of uh, emissions for the state and uh, for other states around the country, uh, which is part of the reason why there's so much focus on building decarbonization policies now. Uh, you see, of course, that fuel use in buildings bounces around a little bit each year, driven largely by weather, right? A cold winter will increase fuel consumption, a warm winter will decrease fuel consumption. Uh, but we see that over the last, you know, um, nearly two decades, uh, total fuel use in Mar Maryland's buildings has remained pretty much flat. So the solution, which is a super common one and probably is sitting in your backyard right now are uh, ultra low NOx or zero emission heating equipment which reduce or eliminate direct emissions from buildings and provide low energy costs. So what are we talking about here? Zero emission equipment like electric wa uh, water heaters and heat pumps are already the best-selling heating systems in Maryland. Uh, lots of benefits of course to heat pumps which is among the reasons why they're the best-selling heating systems in Maryland. <clears throat> um, it's one device for all of your heating and cooling, right? A heat pump serves as both the air conditioner and the heating system, uh, eliminating the cost of buying and maintaining two separate systems. It's more efficient than air conditioning, right? A, a heat pump can reduce cooling, cooling costs and summertime electricity consumption by about 18% compared to a comparable air conditioner. Uh, they're more efficient than other heaters. The savings can be greater than $1,000 per year compared to other heating sources. Uh, transitioning to a heat pump from a fuel burning uh, equipment can be part of a building's uh, total electrification and departure from the need for gas service in the first place, which can of course have other co-benefits like decreasing the risk of gas explosions. We've had several Marylanders uh, die and, and more that have been injured in recent years from uh, gas explosions inside of buildings. They, of course, improve air quality because uh, heat pumps are zero emissions. Uh, they improve occupant comfort, and they're heavily subsidized by the federal government, uh, including a 30% tax credit for consumers, uh, rebates for limited income households, and millions of dollars of federal investment going to uh, expand uh, heat pump manufacturing. <clears throat> uh, they provide lower heating and cooling costs than other heating and cooling systems. Um, the uh, average Marylander who uses a heat pump saves about $700 per year on average compared to comparable heating systems. Uh, that uh, is as low as a $360 uh, per year savings compared with gas customers and up to uh, $1,670 compared with electric resistance customers. Those are people who, who heat their homes with electric resistance heaters. With heat pump water heaters, there's also significant savings. Uh, a heat pump water heater is three to four times more efficient than an electric water heater. Uh, so they save about $350 a year on average, and that's about $500 a year compared to electric resistance uh, water heaters and about $150 compared to gas water heaters. Upgrading to a heat pump water heater pays back within two years for the majority of Maryland homes. There are many federal, state, and power incentives that reduce the upfront cost of replacing fuel burning equipment with heat pumps, including that federal 30% uh, tax credit that I mentioned earlier, providing up to $2,000 for all customers or consumers. Um, up to $14,000 in electrification rebates for low, moderate, and middle income households. These rebates will begin flowing uh, to Marylanders in early 2025 through a program administered by the Maryland Energy Administration. Uh, the state also offers up to 100% of the cost for low income households. Uh, that funding source is, of course, limited. We would need an expansion of that funding source managed through the Department of Housing and Community Development to fully cover the cost for all households that would uh, potentially need it. Uh, but, but currently, low-income households, uh, many of them per year, can get 100% of the cost covered by DHCD. The state also offers 0% financing for 24 months for a wide range of energy projects and homes and buildings. And then in power, in power, the utilities are rolling out really robust rebates 
Uh, one example is uh, here, I live in the Pepco area. Um, Pepco is currently offering a $1,600 rebate on a heat pump water heater, which is pretty remarkable. You might be wondering, well, with all these cost savings uh, and all these incentives for it, are additional policies really needed to help drive it? Uh, and yes, in, in fact, what, we, what we've seen and what other organizations have reported is that additional policies really are needed because the typical con customer, when, you, when your heating system goes out, you call a contractor and you say, hey, you know, my heat's out, and they come, and if you need a new furnace, uh, you know, the simple approach for them is to replace that existing furnace with the new furnace. So part of this is about set, setting up a policy um, framework that really encourages the, the contractor to talk to you about the incentives that are available for these other options and to drive the market toward those cleaner heating solutions that also save you money at home. Uh, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships show that uh, clean heat standards and zero emission heating equipment standards stack among other policies that support uh, building decarbonization. And Maryland is considered to be a leader in this space and having multiple uh, policies that, that are supporting this transition. So the zero emission heating equipment standard or ZHES and the clean heat standard or CHS address critical policy gaps. One, when we zoom out and look at the building sector, of course, we've got a lot of emissions associated with the electricity that all buildings use. Um, our clean power policies are reducing emissions from the electricity supply, uh, but they don't reduce direct emissions from buildings. And power is effective at reducing direct and indirect emissions from buildings, but it's not fast enough to meet the uh, state's decarbonization goals. Building energy performance standards, of course, uh, apply only to large buildings. Uh, those buildings are responsible for around 10% of the residential commercial building emissions. So we need some additional policies that focus on the other 90% of the emissions, direct emissions from the building sector. We have no existing policies that focus on small fuel burning equipment, as ZHES will do. No existing policy requires emissions to reduce fast enough to achieve the state's climate goals, as the clean heat standard will do. And the clean heat standard, very importantly, provides additional incentives to help people achieve BEPS and ZHEADS. For these reasons, Governor Moore issued Executive Order 19 of 2024 requiring MDE to propose ZHEADS and CHS. Specifically, we're ordered to propose a zero emission heating equipment standard regulation that will phase in zero emission standards for heating equipment to reduce carbon pollution and improve air quality inside homes and the ambient air, and propose a clean heat standard regulation to expand Maryland's renewable portfolio standard to the thermal energy system, mobilizing investment in clean heat solutions for homes and businesses. So first, I'm gonna talk about the zero emission heating equipment standard. Frankly, between the two, this one is a much more straightforward regulatory program. Uh, it it uh, fairly simply sets um, emissions standards or emissions limits for space heating and water heating equipment, right? So the equipment that's covered includes furnaces, boilers, and water heaters. And similar to emission standards for cars and trucks, Z has set emission standards for this type of typical fuel, fuel burning equipment. Three states have already adopted low NOx uh, standards for water heaters, and at least 10 states are considering zero emission heating heating equipment standards for both heating equipment, space heating equi equipment, and water heating equipment. Uh, California has, of course, been out front on this issue. The Bay Area Air Quality Management District adopted the nation's first zero emission standards for water heaters and furnaces in 2023. The South Coast Air Quality Management District adopted zero emission standards for commercial water heaters uh, this last June with other equipment types to follow. And the California Air Resources Board has committed to implement zero emission standards statewide by 2030, and it's currently developing those regulations. In our region, NESCOM, which is the Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management, is developing a ZHES model rule with input from, from state air regulators, uh, including ones in California, and heating equipment manufacturers. 
Uh, NESCOM has been, uh, you know, an organization for a long time that has assisted member states in meeting their air quality, climate, and environmental justice goals. They provide scientific, technical, and analytical uh, support to the states. Uh, and importantly, they're also the organizer of the Ozone Transport Commission, uh, which extends from Maryland to Virginia. So NESCOM is actually nearing the end of its process in developing a model rule. Uh, NESCOM has been working with states, technical consultants, and manufacturers to develop model rules for zero emission space and water heating equipment. States can use that model rule, uh, but will need to go through their own uh, full rulemaking process. And, and that can include uh, adapting uh, parts of the model rule. So this timeline is just on the NESCOM side, showing that they've gone through a number of steps. And uh, next month, in late October, they will publish their uh, model rule and technical support documents. That then folds into uh, a separate process and timeline, which I'm going to show you in a minute, regarding MDE's rulemaking schedule. So the inputs, there have been many inputs to the ZHES model rule. Uh, including NOx standards for water heaters that uh, that the Regulatory Assistance Project published last year, uh, the the proposals and uh, active regulations in California, uh, the cost and market feasibility assessment, uh, health impacts analysis, um, recommendations from technical consultants, inputs from stakeholders, including very importantly manufacturers and members of NESCOM's Environmental Justice Advisory Group. So the very basic architecture of the model rule, it covers NOx and combustion greenhouse gases. It covers furnaces, boilers, and water heaters, including those that run on natural gas, heating oil, and propane. It requires a low NOx or zero emission option when installing new equipment in both new and existing buildings after a specific uh, compliance date. It does not require changing out any existing functional equipment it has nothing to do with cooking equipment. Uh, it allows for existing equipment to be serviced and, man and maintained uh, beyond the compliance period uh, dates. And it allows for the temporary installation of non-compliant equipment. And actually, th this last piece is really important because uh, for people, including <laughs> some folks on my team who've gone through electrification projects recently, switching out you know, fuel burning equipment with heat pumps, uh, there can be an extra step in some cases of needing an electrical service upgrade to the house, be it, you know, at the panel or um, or even sometimes even a, a heavy up uh, of, of the electric service to uh, the building. In those cases, that's that's a, an additional timeline that it can take uh, to implement, you know, the installation of the, the heat pump. Um, so for those reasons, we are, you know, following, working with other other jurisdictions, following the lead of other jurisdictions that are allowing for the temporary installation uh, of up to six months of, you know, a furnace. If, you, if you, your furnace dies in the middle of winter, a contractor can come in and the same day, you know, replace your furnace with another working furnace to get your heat restored. Uh, but then that would just be a, a, a loaner piece of equipment. Um, and the contractor would come back, um, you know, probably after the winter has ended and do the full uh, upgrade of your equipment and service. <clears throat> so MDE intends to get stakeholder input on the model rule later this year and to adopt a final ZHES rule by the end of 2025. Um, our I, actually i'm going to end this presentation with a little bit of an overview of our outreach schedule coming up but basically this fall we'll be seeking input on the model rule and meeting with stakeholders and also trying to convert the model rule into a maryland rule uh, we will come back to ACAC in the first half of 2025 to present a draft rule to you all uh, we'll then of course go through the rest of the process of publishing the proposed rule and holding a public hearing uh, with the goal of adopting the rule by the end of next calendar year. So uh, you may have questions about ZHES. Uh, we'll uh, save some time at the end. I'm going to just keep on going though and give you a really quick overview of the clean heat standard. A little bit more complicated than, the, than just setting emissions limits, focused on the manufacturers of heating equipment, 
This one is a, a requirement for the entire building sector, the emissions from building sector, to reduce at the pace required to meet Maryland's clean air and climate change goals. So it's a performance standard requiring fossil heat providers to deliver gradually increasing percentages of clean heat services to customers. In this way, a clean heat standard encourages fossil heat providers to become clean heat providers. This is very similar to uh, the structure of, of a policy called a renewable portfolio standard, which requires our electricity suppliers to deliver increasing amounts of renewable electricity, right? Thereby helping the, um, the electricity suppliers transition from largely fossil to clean electricity suppliers. A clean heat standard is, is that same sort of concept, but applied to thermal the thermal energy sector. The schedule of reductions matches the state's greenhouse gas reduction schedule. Uh, a clean heat standard provides choices, including weatherization, heat pumps, and alternative fuels. Obligated parties can deliver uh, customer can, oh, I think I got a typo in there, sorry about that, uh, can help customers convert to zero emission heating equipment standards, deliver alternative fuels, or purchase credits from others. And just about um, anything from existing programs, or many things from existing programs, that are already deploying these clean heat measures, right? Like the, the federal incentives that I mentioned earlier for heat pump installs. A lot of consumers are taking advantage of that. That's great. Every one of those installations or things that are done through Empower generate clean heat credits and help the obligated parties meet their obligations. So the basic structure here, there's a state-specific rule placing a quantitative obligation on fossil heating companies to create clean heat credits by delivering clean heat services directly or through a third party to customers, right? And, and those, those measures can be building insulation, heat pumps, uh, alternative fuels, or other measures. The obligated parties are the, the pipeline gas utilities and companies that deliver heating fuels, including fuel oil and propane. Uh, third parties, including HVAC contractors and housing providers are not obligated. They can, however, earn clean heat credits and sell them to obligated parties. Building owners and residents are also not obligated, uh, but they benefit from the investments that others make in generating clean heat credits. The obligated parties have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by ensuring the delivery of clean heat services to Marylanders. Uh, the obligation is in proportion to each company's fossil heat sales, and clean heat credits are earned by actions at customer locations in Maryland that reduce emissions measured in tons of greenhouse gases or carbon dioxide equivalents. Uh, credits must be retired each year and obligated parties have the option to outsource their obligation to the state's designated delivery agent. In other words, if, if you're a company that delivers um, you know, fuel oil to customers and you don't care to, to diversify your business to get into delivering more clean heat solutions, uh, you can pass your obligation to, to, to earn and retire credits uh, to another entity. Lots of different actions can earn clean heat credits, including weatherization, such as air sealing and, and adding insulation to buildings, uh, installing, of course, zero emission heating equipment, and uh, helping customers utilize alternative uh, fuels, including biofuels and hydrogen. Although very importantly to note, alternative fuels are evaluated on a net life cycle emissions basis and there are some other important environmental guardrails uh, that we put in there, right? Like with, um, well, first of all, there's, there would not be fossil to fossil fuel switching, right? So if a customer is simply switching from fuel oil to natural gas, that has some emissions benefits, uh, but it's not, it's not part of the clean uh, heat transition that we're trying to enable for the state. So there would not be credits for fossil to fossil fuel switching. Uh, the credits that would be earned would be based on life cycle emissions using the EPA and Argonne National Labs GREET analysis. And we also have set some guardrails such as biomethane has to actually be delivered in methane in, in uh, Maryland. Uh, you can't have a, 
a landfill in Wisconsin generating, you know, renewable gas and taking credit for deliveries in Maryland. It actually has to be used in Maryland. Very importantly, equity is a core goal of the clean heat standard. It's a mandate for us to leave no one behind in the transition to a clean energy future. Progressive, uh, a progressive inclusion mandate requires the delivery of clean heat services to low and moderate income households and supports the weatherization projects and heat pump installations that reduce household energy costs and address energy burden in our state. So the very basic schedule here is that in 2026, obligated parties would begin reporting data to MDE and they could earn early action credits, right? So 26 is basically just a reporting year. 2027 is the first year when obligated parties would begin registering, again, either directly or through a contractor, enough clean heat credits to meet their annual obligation. Consumers begin receiving additional information about and incentives for clean heat services in that year. We see lots of benefits to a clean heat standard. It's a clear, predictable, long range schedule for Maryland to transition from fossil heat to clean heat, which is a transition that we think is gonna take, you know, about 20 to 25 years. It's a long, long term transition. Obligated parties are motivated to promote the lowest cost options for deploying clean heat measures, such as promoting the existing incentives. It supports other policies and provides incentives to help building owners pay for ZHES and BEPS. It assures benefits to low and moderate income families, allows diverse heat sources, resources, and customer choice. It supports heat pump installations with credits and, and promotes replacement before failure. And actually, th this is an important component of the clean heat standard as in as we consider it uh, uh, in parallel with the ZHES. Um, ZHES only looks at the replacement of equipment at the end of its useful life. Looking only through that lens, we do not decarbonize Maryland's buildings fast enough to achieve the state's climate requirements. Uh, so, so providing additional incentive to help people switch to heating equipment that'll save them money earlier is part of the design goal of a clean heat standard. Uh, and of course, it's it's paid for by, um, by the users of fossil fuels. There are no electric rate impacts. At least 10 states, including a cluster of states in the mid-Atlantic and Northeast are developing or considering a clean heat standard. So this is a snapshot of our uh, timeline for developing the rules around the clean heat standard. We started more than a year ago when we secured technical assistance from the Regulatory Assistance Project, or RAP, who last year, around this time last year, published a paper on how the clean heat standard would work in Maryland. So this information has been out there for, for quite a while now. Uh, we began drafting a clean heat standard rule with RAP support uh, and uh, it initiated the process of doing the emissions, health, and cost impact analysis. This fall, we intend to get input from stakeholders on components of the draft regulation, and then in the first quarter or first half of 2025, present a draft reporting rule to you all at ACAC. Uh, the goal is to adopt a reporting rule by the end of 2025, and then in 2026, present to you all the performance standards that would be layered into that rule uh, with the goal of adopting performance standards by the end of 2026. And just as a quick wrap up here, looking ahead to our, stake our, our stakeholder engagement uh, plan for the next few months here. Uh, so today we're previewing ZHES and CHS for you all. Uh, in October, late October, we think, Nescom is going to do a webinar on the ZHES model rule. And then in November, we will do our own webinar to get more information out about ZHES and the clean heat standard. We'll launch a process for collecting stakeholder input. We'll meet with obligated parties and other stakeholders. And of course, December and, and probably for many months beyond that, we'll have additional meetings with obligated parties and stakeholders about these rules. 
Um, we encourage you to uh, reach out with any questions. Our uh, policy analyst, uh, Cameron uh, Arnstein, is going to be assisting us with the outreach, so feel free to reach out to her. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions or comments that you all have about what I presented. Thank you, Mark. Um, obviously, we're going to have this, both of these issues come back before the committee over time, but um, to the extent first that committee members have questions, this is a good time. Uh, uh, this is Ross. Across. I have a question. Uh, first off, uh, great job, Mark, as always. Uh, so for the CHS, the part of it that's a little disconnected in my mind is I assume that, you know, the entity is the gas company that, you know, provides natural gas. And I under, was paying attention and listening, but I didn't quite pick up. Are you proposing that they pay for a heat pump in their customers' homes and get credit for it? You know, it says install heat pump, but who pays? These are expensive items. and why would a gas company possibly do that? They're not going to then sell gas to the customer. So I have kind of a major disconnect in um, in some of the key bullets of that. Could you take this and run with it, please? Yeah, the, uh, you know, I want to go back to, to a comment I made about how, number one, customers are already taking advantage of a lot of incentives, federal incentives and power incentives. All of those things will generate clean heat credit. So we see that there's a lot already happening uh, that is generating or has the potential once the, once registered to generate clean heat credits and help the obligated parties meet their obligations, including BEPS, right? I mean, build, large buildings are also doing a bunch of projects to decrease emissions. That generates clean heat credits. And then the gas utilities themselves are getting into um, network geothermal installations. You know, this was promoted by the Warmth Act um, this last year uh, and expanding their services to be clean heat providers. The, the gas utilities have also been really progressive on, on this front, presenting their own decarbonization plans. BGE has a very robust decarbonization plan for its system. Washington Gas presented to, to, to DC customers its decarbonization plan, which really fit uh, kind of hand in glove with the clean heat standard because the transition that the gas utilities have articulated uh is one that that can be supported through the clean heat standard and in, in being a very you know wide-ranging um program that allows for a lot of different um uh, measures to be installed so you know we we see that a lot of the clean heat credit acquisition is going to happen because of the things that are already happening but we also anticipate that there's going to be a need for some additional clean heat credits to be earned um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity that we have through uh, partnership with the gas utilities and the, the heating fuel distributors to have them play a role in getting the information out to customers about all of these incentives. Again, most consumers in Maryland are are not aware of the incentives that exist. You know, the typical consumer, if you're if you're water comes out of the shower cold you call a contractor and you're like my my water is cold and that contractor might show up and with very little conversation swap out your old gas water heater with a new one and for the next 12 15 years you're locked into another gas water heater so you know a lot of this is about encouraging that conversation uh yes there could be some additional cost for the gas utilities for the fuel distributors to promote those those incentives to offer additional incentives um and you know presumably they would bake some of that cost into their general cost of services for their customers i guess we'll have to talk further that didn't quite answer my question but um we can talk offline i mean like i was more tangibly wondering how a gas company benefits from my insulin, you know, do, do I just sell them my credit? I own a home, I go from gas to, but but you, I don't want to jump, monopolize this, but that didn't quite answer my question. Maybe if I could take a, a crack at it. Functionally, Ross, you just uh, touched on how the regulation would actually work. The gas utilities have to provide credits 
right? Just like under the renewable portfolio standard, the electric utilities have to provide credits representing clean electricity. The gas utilities would then have to provide credits representing clean heat. So they could do that by paying to, by offering incentives for customers to install heat pumps themselves and then claim the credits from those. But they could also uh, purchase credits from all the heat pumps that people are already putting in because they're getting funding from some other source. And since there are so many different funding sources out there, we think that a lot of these credits will effectively be provided um, uh, more or less funded by these other programs. So there wouldn't necessarily always be a net cost. Um, but again, to the extent that we're trying to accelerate, there could be, right? Sometimes these credits could cost money and the regulated entities would have to uh, pay to procure them. Um, so there would be some regulatory costs, just like any regulation. Um, but generally, functionally, gas utilities and the delivered fuel suppliers have to provide credits sufficient to achieve the clean heat goal for the year. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Sunny Park, just uh, out of curiosity. So uh, you mentioned about like alternative fuel as a hydrogen. And is there like any, I mean, any like a uh, picture that you see that will be hydrogen bio like a unit? will be out there because I haven't seen that yet so yeah I mean we the, the the zero emission heating equipment standards you know again it's important to to, to uh, see these two things moving together because what we see in in terms of the the typical solution for small regular heating equipment that delivers you know low temp space heating and water heating which is the the majority of our uh, energy use and, and emissions um, from the building sector. Um, you know, we've got tried and true zero emission heating equipment that doesn't need to run on hydrogen or biofuel or anything else that, that is serving that space very well and providing very low customer costs. There is, however, a role for alternative fuels for higher temp applications, for larger scale uh, applications, all of which, remember, the, the building sector is a large, diverse sector. So we see especially a role or potentially a role for alternative fuels in some niche areas, especially for higher temp applications in certain parts of the building sector. Yeah. And I think I see your hand up. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. This is Ben. Yeah, hi. Um, I, I wanted to follow up on Ross's comment and just uh, just to say that um, there's a, a bigger issue with uh, the gas utilities and the uh, whole death spiral dynamic that's uh, going to result from a, a electrification um, and switching away from gas uh, and that um, as we the transition moves and we get closer to uh, a decarbonized heating sector, you know the the, the uh, extreme, of course, is one customer bearing all the gas network um, <laughs> costs because uh, everybody else has switched away. Clearly, the program will have to be uh, redesigned in the meanwhile. Um, so uh, we may start with something like this, but. Um, if indeed the death spiral does happen for gas utilities, they're going to have to be uh, bigger changes, at, and uh, this will be uh, basically another uh, another burden for gas utilities. But it's uh, probably not the biggest problem they're going to face, and uh, well, hopefully we'll have uh, time to adjust and figure out how to do this in a way that um, is fair to gas, gas customers and everybody else. Yeah, I appreciate that comment. Um, gas rates have been increasing for gas customers uh, in Maryland at, at a breathtaking rate. So, um, you know, it's among the reasons we see that it's really important to think about uh, to promote the, the, you know, alternatives to customers um, who are already, um, you know, burdened with increasing, rapidly increasing gas costs. Mark, this is Brandy. Um, Dr. Latshaw had, had posted a uh, comment in the chat. If uh, Dr. Latshaw, if you would like to read it or I can read it for you. Oh, sure, sure. yeah. Um, so uh, thanks, Mark, for your presentation. This is exciting. Um, 
for both of these, you mentioned health impact assessment, which being at the School of Public Health at Hopkins made me very happy. Um, I think you said for the ZHES one, it was already done. Can that be shared? And who does these health impact assessments? Yeah, good question. In in either case, are they final? But certainly, our our norm is to to publish, you know, all of our supporting uh, studies and our technical documents. Uh, so yeah, when when they're uh, uh, complete, uh, we'll be we'll be happy to share them, of course. Great. And who does them? Is it the Department of Health? Uh, no, uh, we have we have a variety of consultants that um, are doing these different ones for the for the clean heat standard. Um, we have um, access to. Uh, consultant. Well, actually, I can't share yet because the ink isn't dry on the contract. But uh, let, let me actually shift to the zero emission heating equipment standard is being supported again by Nescom. Nescom has hired uh, a consultant named Energy Solutions to do <clears throat> really comprehensive um, impact analysis. Uh, we're supplementing that with an additional analysis that we contracted through AECOM. Um, and then there's there are other organizations out there like RMI that have been trying to analyze the impact of a Maryland specific ZS policy. So we've got analyses coming in from a lot of different angles. Um, and conveniently, you know, they're they're really um, kind of corroborating uh, each other and and helping us kind of um, you know hone in on on a, what we think is a, a pre pretty reasonable expectation of the impacts because there's so much consistency in the findings between these different ana analyses or at least the draft analyses that we've seen so far great thanks i don't see any other hands up are there any other questions from the committee I see that there are 47 people on here, which is much more than both MDE and the committee. So to the extent that members of the public have any questions, this is an opportunity. And, and Todd, there was, this is Randy, um, there was one um, a comment or a question that was posted in the chat. Um, I'm not sure whether you can read that, Mark, or um, we can read it all for you if you like. Uh, is this regarding Dave's comment? Uh, do we have a backup plan in case CO2 capture does not work? Yes, that's yeah. correct. Uh, good, good question. So this is maybe referencing one slide that I showed that sh that showed the emissions trajectory under our climate plan, and in our net zero emissions by 2045 scenario and and modeling. Uh, there's a role for uh, CO2 removal technologies to um, to capture some of the CO2 emissions that are still being emitted by uh, economic activities in Maryland. Um, so that is uh, something that's, that's very important for us to to dig into more. Um, uh, you know, the the modeling uh, in the modeling environment, it deployed a lot of CO2 removal technologies because it found that it was cheaper to do so, to build these new technologies, to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. It was cheaper to do that than to squeeze the last bit of, uh, of emissions out of Maryland's economy. So in the modeling environment, that's why it has the role that it has. Um, there's of course, you know, year by year, we have technology advancements, the economics of uh, reducing emissions uh, changes. So I think that that piece uh, in particular is a piece where we're going to focus more and more in our future modeling and uh, in the development of our next climate plan. By the end of this decade, the state's final plan to achieve net zero emissions by 2045 is due. So it's on our on our on our to do list to to further refine. The, um, the expectations around CO2 removal technologies in the state's final net zero emissions plan. Uh, but but our, our primary, primary focus right now is a 60% reduction in gross greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2031. Uh, so we're, we're not really diving into the deployment of CO2 removal technologies at this point to support the long-term net zero goal. Okay, thank you for that, Mark. 
Final call for questions. Oh, Mark, thank you very much for that presentation. Thanks to everybody at MDE for this important briefing. It's very helpful for us to get this information ahead of time to begin to think about it and to formulate questions. To the extent that the committee members have additional questions that they want to ask between now and the next briefing, please feel free to send those to the department so that we can keep the conversation going. This is obviously going to play out over a, a multi-year period. Um, anything else from uh, the department, Chris? Should note that. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Randy. I was just going to note the uh, upcoming uh, council meeting dates that you should all have on your calendar. December 9th. It's uh, sep se September 16th. That's now. Um, is, the, is the next planned one. Ross seems that's perplexed. Today. You not that's us. us today. That's oh, I'm so that's sorry. I'm actually Good listening. Job, you're technically <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so make sure you're all here today. Uh, it's December 9th. I'm so sorry. I'm so used to reading off what's at the bottom of the thing. Um, December 9th is our next one that we have uh, planned. We are potentially planning on bringing an action item uh, before the council at that point, uh, uh, a minor one, as well as potentially some continued updated briefings on our climate plans. So, um, and at that at that time, we will also be pro providing to the council uh, some proposed dates for 2025. Thank you, Chris. Great, and I'll just add as a follow-up on uh, a prior action item, you'll recall we reproposed the Building Energy Performance Standards, or BEPS, uh, which Mark mentioned a couple of times. Uh, that uh, proposal is out. It published in the Maryland Register. It's out for comment now. Um, our uh, our hearing for that is, uh, Carolyn, help me, October the... 9th. 9th. October 9th. Um, so that, uh, that regulation is moving along. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks to everybody for joining us. We'll see you again in just a couple of short months. Thank you all for your participation in the council's journey.